necessarily be really clear about what's going on. The thief entering, who's a burglar, going into somebody's home has a degree of mindfulness that most meditators would envy. <laughs> One is sitting downstairs watching reality TV while upstairs the reality is there's a burglar who is stealing one's prize, whatever, jewellery or whatever. And the burglar moving upstairs, mindfulness is far higher level than what we had in the forest. <laughs> Mindful of every sound, every moment, every step as he goes and steals the items. But does not have sati, that's mindfulness, sampajanya, which means clear comprehension. Understand? So, comprehension. To comprehend. To really know what is going on. Sati Sampajanya. So when mindfulness is accompanied with a clear, clearly comprehending what's going on, I call this awareness. Mm -hmm. Consciousness is conscious, it is energized, it is present, and there is a clear comprehension of what is taking place. And therefore one is aware of trust and lack of trust. One is aware of the intentions which are at work. One is aware of the influential factors that are arising affecting the awareness. Then, with this awareness, or with this mindfulness with clear comprehension, <laughs> the same thing, this contributes significantly to having a wise or clear relationship with the world. It contributes to watching our ego, to understanding clinging and holding and possessiveness, etc. In this, being a very conscious human being, a very mindful human being, with clear comprehension which is there, as I said earlier, the world of objects is important that means sight, sound, smell, taste and touch is important to the subject the world of objects is established as an object by a subject called consciousness sometimes called myself sometimes called who I am, more precisely, who I think I am. One of the vulnerabilities in the teachings is for a conclusion to be drawn, and I hear this in some of the Eastern traditions, in which the view is established, I am not the body because it's an object. So I can't be the body. I am not the body because I'm not the mind or the a mental state because I can look at it. So I can't be what I look at. It's an object. I'm not my thoughts, I'm not my feelings. Therefore, who I am is pure consciousness. Who I am is mindfulness with clear comprehension. I can't place mindfulness or clear comprehension, or, or pure consciousness, or awareness in front of me. I can't get it, the subject, in front. Everything else I can do, I can say, oh, there's, there's, there's this mind state, there are these thoughts, there are these feelings, there are these sights, sounds, smells, tastes, touch, I can get everything, in, look at everything. But the subject, so-called subject, can't get in front. So some traditions therefore draw the conclusion you are pure consciousness. That's who you are. You are pure awareness. This is your true nature. Oh no it isn't. 
No, no, it isn't. This is to rest in pure awareness, which is beautiful. To rest in pure consciousness, I'm using the words interchangeably now, or mindfulness with clear comprehension, is beautiful to rest in that, and not to feel lost in the objects. Not to feel, um, I am these objects which I give attention to. It's a beautiful thing. But the eye has arisen, and it has drawn the conclusion, I am pure awareness. All things rest in awareness. All objects come to appearance through consciousness. Therefore, I am pure consciousness. I would say that view is a view from one who has simply not gone deep enough. All right, that's it. Questions? <laughs> Don't want to make it too easy, do I? <laughs> Our responses. Is it uh, not like that you just mentioned? Mm -hmm. Because in meditation, subject and object is one. It can't be divided in dualistic. Mm -hmm. Right. So, again, for those of you who are uh, listening, because important question there, it isn't easy to follow, so one has to remember this. Sometimes, uh, before I touch the point, we listen and it goes straight over the head. Why not? Why not? Just let it go. We listen and it only lands between here and here. Well, why not? <coughs> Etc. We listen, and it might touch some feeling response inside. Wow, really getting a sense of what's being explored. Well, why not? <laughs> and sometimes it touches some other place which brings about some realization that makes a real difference. Why not? We don't have control. We can go anywhere it likes. What words? We go above, we just land here, uh, here, or whatever. As long as we don't draw the conclusion, it is because of what is being said. <laughs> Nothing to do with it. Things just go where they go. So in this case, objects are established in this phenomenal life by a subject who establishes them. The, sub the objects establish the subject. I can't have objects without a subject. And I can't have a subject without an object. It is not possible. It makes the terms meaningless. Therefore, my life appears to be an ongoing relationship, as Michael was pointing out. An ongoing relationship moving back and forward between the subject and the object. And I think it is fair to say, as we, Michael and I discussed, fair to say that objects affect the subject. You may all may be completely bored. You may be drifting and waiting for tea. I go like this. Who can say, nah, not interested to listen to it. No choice. No, 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 no. It can't be blocked out there. There. So, the object, called the bell, has just influenced the consciousness of everybody in this room, because it just entered it. What may arise may be some response to it. And then, that might become the object of your interest. How did I respond when Christopher hit the bell? What was the state of mind? Was it, well, gosh, it really does show how little control I have. Huh? Subject influences the object, object influences the subject. In this, without looking outside of it, is all the great discovery. No, no beyond, we don't need it. Let's try it in this dynamic. The subject and the object 
is a useful construction that the mind has made. The subject and the object is a useful interpretation that the mind has made about how we believe or think things really are. And therefore she said, Jewel, is it? Is this? Do we live in subject-object? Do we? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Uh, you made a distinction between sati, mindfulness, yes. and sampachana, yeah. the knowledge. Yeah. As far as I remember from the basic mindfulness suttas of the Buddha, yeah. sati patana sutta, mm-hmm. asati sutta, they only talk about sati, mindfulness. And there's one little chapter about sampachana, but the progress of insight is yeah. described within the suttas, yeah. culminating in definite knowledge or ultimate knowledge, mm. both suttas, this is mentioned as the final yeah. uh, aim of it, of yeah. uh, realization. Yeah. And this seems to come about just mm. through the cultivation of sati. All right. Mm-hmm. So sati seems to have these different steps, and as far as I understand it, you said at one point, this bhagra, mm-hmm. at the top of the room, has a far higher degree of mindfulness than the person below, and this kind of mindfulness, which is flexible, and completely independent mm-hmm. of motivation, I think in Buddhist definition would be momentary concentration, mm-hmm. which is one achievement of mindfulness, yes. but mindfulness never stops with it. No. The goal of mindfulness always seems to be to come to an increasing understanding of the three marks of existence, yeah. anatta, mm-hmm. the impermanence, dukkha and anatta. Yeah. So, and often it, it is defined or restricted Mm-hmm. to this momentary concentration, which is not its ultimate goal, as far yeah. as I understand. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. so, let's go to the, the text a uh, little bit there. Um, when I read the text, though there is je- reference to bhavana, to development, development of mindfulness, etc. And that is an important factor and it does give the practitioner the encouragement to develop their practice, as we say. And this Sampajanya, this Sati uh, Sampajanya, (coughs) any practice which is is developing will naturally bring more comprehension. It will bring more understanding about change we will bring more understanding about the unsatisfactoriness of clinging or being identified with change and it will remind us just how impersonal this whole process is just going back to that just there regardless of what the self wish of the self is so greater and uh, clear comprehension about life will help us significantly to be able to deal with impermanence, to see unsatisfactoriness that's wrapped up in it, and to see its non-self characteristic, meaning how impersonal it is, the events of life. Sometimes going with our wishes, sometimes not going with our with our wishes. So from a place of sati, mindfulness, will, for a human being interested in developing herself or himself, will come to clearer comprehension. But there is a point, and, and I think this see both from the text here and also from working with people, that there is a point where the interest in developing oneself, itself, the importance of it gets less. And there is a sense of one's potential as a human being to come to profound understanding and realization right now. So the idea 